Coming up, I get my hands on a Saga keyboard. I play some games. Jeff looks at some programming tools for the next. I find another unheard audio track. And I end with a type in. Let's get on then. If you've watched the show before, you will know the Spectrum had many replacement keyboards, the most popular probably being the DK-Tronics one, but others included the Stone Chip, the Cheetah and the Cade models. Those are also the ones that I've got in my collection, the Metal Beast that is the Transform keyboard, and the Low Profile keyboard. There was another one though that I had in the mid 80s, and one that I've always been hoping to get back, the Saga Emperor. Here is a picture of my original, and it was a brilliant keyboard. The Emperor began to appear in magazines around mid-1984, selling for £54.45. pence. It boasted a full-size keyboard, full travel professional keys, and a full-size spacebar. Gradually the price dropped over the years, and by 1986 it had dropped to just £39.95. pence. Last year I managed to finally get hold of one at a decent price and can now add a Spectrum inside it and get it working. Saga produced quite a few different keyboards, with the Emperor probably being the most popular. They did take on the low profile after advanced memory systems went bust though, but that wasn't a real Saga. The thing that set the Saga keyboards apart from the rest was the colour. They were beige. The Emperor came with stickers for the keycaps, and you first had to get your Spectrum into it, or rather onto it, before you could use it. To fit your Spectrum, you had to remove the upper case and keyboard. This was easily done, just five screws and the top came away. You plugged in the Saga ribbon cables, and then put the whole bottom part of the Spectrum, including the motherboard, onto the lower part of the Saga case, and Saga provided special bolts for this. You then flipped it over, put on the top case, flipped it back, and screwed that in place. And then it was ready. Compared to the other keyboards that I've had, this was by far the easiest to put together. Once it was all complete, it was time to give it a try. The first thing was games, and obviously Jetpack was my first choice. It worked perfectly. Great feel to those keys as well, and I'd forgotten just how good it was. Other well, games worked fine, and all the keys had a decent travel and provided a good response and feedback. The keyboard was laid out in a strange way though. For example, there's an edit key, but to use it, you had to hold down the shift key above it, which sort of defeats the point of having a separate key. And the same could be true for the cursor keys as well. They couldn't work on their own, you had to hold down the shift key. On the other side of the keyboard, there are keys for full stop, comma, semicolon, and again, they don't work independently, you have to hold down the shift key to get them to work. The keyboard also has two enter keys, which was something I didn't recall from mine, but upon looking at the photographs again, yes it did. This strange layout and key placement did take a while to get used to after using the normal rubber keyed version or even the DK-Tronics keyboard. Eventually, as I got more used to it though, it became easier to remember and use. This keyboard really shines when used for text entry. It's so much faster than using the original rubber keys. And as said before, once you get used to the placements, it becomes easier and faster. The stickers on mine were a little worn in places, but it did come with a new set. Now I'm not sure if this came from Saga themselves or from a third party, but it's useful if I decide to remove the old ones and put the new ones on. The keyboard felt really nice. A very positive action, a nice click, and a very professional addition to your kit. The beige colour sets it apart from other replacements, and it was great to use this again. If you typed a lot of things out, for example your own games, or maybe letters in a word processor, or even typing games from a magazine, then this would greatly improve things. A fantastic keyboard. And it even has a place for your pens.
This is Enduro, released by Activision in 1984. Enduro was one of several games Activision brought from the Atari VCS system to the Spectrum. The others included Beam Rider, Hero, Pitfall, Lost Caverns, River Raid and Zenji. Enduro is a 3D racing game that seems to have no end point. You set off and have to overtake a certain number of cars, as shown in the counter in the control panel. And once you've done this, the counter changes and resets, and it starts all over again. The instructions say you have to overtake them all by the end of the day, at which point it gets dark, as we shall see. The game does look like it's come straight from the Atari, with chunky graphics and poor sound. The road is just a line, and there's no roadside scenery at all. The cars look like, well I'm not really sure, a sort of cross between a tank and a crab I suppose. Hitting the side of the road, or another car, will slow you down, and the faster you go, the less time you have to move out of the way of the other cars. The control is responsive though, and it needs to be, but the sound soon gets annoying. The scenery changes as you drive along, and if you can stay awake long enough, you get to the night sections. Here, everything just turns black, and all you can see are two lights of the cars and these parts are quite tricky. And then as the final part approaches, the visibility drops to half, which is even more tricky. Eventually though you will overtake all the cars and it starts again. Now I'm presuming things change for each day, like the timer gets less or the roads get narrower or something, but to be honest, I just got a little bored by this point. I can see how this could have been challenging back in 1984, for a short amount of time anyway, but there were much better driving games around at this time. This is Impossible, released by Houston Consultants in 1987. Do you have the nerve and skill to guide your bouncing Impossible through the corridors of doom? This is the challenge set by the game. You control a bouncing ball, in a very impressive moving corridor. In the corridor are cylinders, and these have to be bounced on to squash them. To complete a level, every cylinder has to be squashed. Also in the corridor though are spikes, and these obviously are very bad. Moving around is easy, and the 3D effect is really great and very smooth, and some nice parallax as well. Impossible has inertia too, and it does take a while to get used to the movement and control. Now I know Zeus Daz has asked me to review this many many times, and he's an expert on this, so no doubt he's laughing right now. Some of the cylinders are positioned so that you have to bounce, move, hit and move again all in the same action, which is very difficult to master. You can get extra time by bouncing on the magic rings, but bouncing on it again will lose you a life. The sound is a bit basic to be honest, making no use of the AY chip, but it's adequate and helps concentrate the mind especially with that timer ticking down slowly. You often end up rushing through and bouncing straight onto a spike. The gameplay is addictive, but tricky and it takes a while to get used to the 3D, and where the moving enemies are in relation to the ball. It's a mightily impressive looking game, with a unique style and gameplay. I spent a while on this, 
but never really got anywhere. But on the odd occasion that I did, I wanted to get straight back in and see how far I could get. Using the RZX playback, the later levels have even more things to avoid, and narrower spaces to navigate. Tentacles and lightning bolts are all over the place. I enjoyed watching the playback a little bit more than playing the game, I think. The scrolling is excellent, and the challenges sometimes look impossible to complete. Hats off to Zeus Daz then for completing this game. I don't think I could get anywhere near. This is The Humans, written by Gabriella More in 2021. Anyone familiar with Lemmings will immediately get this game. You have to save just one human though, rather than a set number, and this will get you to the next level. Across the top of the screen are a number of icons, and each can change the behaviour of the selected human. For example, the first level needs the humans to be able to dig. You select the dig icon by using the 1 and 2 keys to move, and then just click on the human that you want to dig. More actions are required as the levels get gradually harder, and you have to get your humans to float, build ladders, act as blockers, and use a pickaxe. The game was written using AGDX Mini, which is pretty impressive, and the level layouts increase in difficulty as the game progresses. The graphics work really well and the level design is excellent, and the game has some great music while you're playing. Overall this is an excellent puzzle action game. If you enjoyed Lemons, this game should be on your list and should be downloaded as quickly as possible. from a theme from last series. We're going to have a look at another tool for Spectrum Next development today. These are Remy Sharp's Spectrum Next tools. There is a text to basic tool, although you can do that on the Next itself, so I've never used that. There is a whole array of sprite tools which are really useful. There are audio tools, and then there is a list of generic tools. And the reason I actually did this was I was looking for a tool to convert bitmaps into SL2 screens, layer 2 screens for the Spectrum Next. And I found these tools and they were really useful and I thought, well, I'm probably going to use them in a future section on the Spectrum show, so I better go through the tools first. I'm only going to look at two of the tools that I use in the sprite section today. The first of those is the sprite editor itself, which is really useful. You get lots of tools in there. You can edit 8-bit or 4-bit sprites. The 4-bit sprites are most useful for the tile map, which I'll come on to. As you can see here, I've already been using the sprite editor to create some sprites that look very similar to a 1980s arcade game. One of the great things about these tools is the usage part at the bottom. That'll tell you all the things that you can and can't do and how to use the tool. I find that really useful. Another really great part of the sprite editor tool is the ability to animate your sprites. You can pop out the animation section at the side, choose how many frames you want to animate, the frame skip, and see your sprites beautifully animated. 
You can also either get them to bounce or get them to just loop around. The export section of the tool is particularly useful. You can export in various formats from basic to ASM to binary and I've used this a lot. You can also save your sprites in various formats so that you can load them back up and reuse them later. With this being a browser based tool one thing I do find is that if you want to work on two different sets of sprites at the same time the easiest way to do that is to use different browsers. And I must admit, sometimes I've had two browsers with different sprites loaded in. Normally one set of sprites I'm working on and one set of tiles for a tile map I'm working on. That brings me to the tile map. And continuing the Pac-Man theme, I've created some tiles that will allow me to reproduce the Pac-Man maze, as you can see here. It's really easy to do and you can quickly build up whatever tile map you want. Although I did find when doing this I couldn't quite fit a full Pac-Man screen into a Spectrum Next screen. Again these tile maps can be exported in the export function, which I have used many many times. If you were doing any kind of Spectrum Next development, then I thoroughly recommend that you look at these tools and see what they can do. I haven't used the audio tools, I will admit, but that looks pretty comprehensive as well. Although I'm sure it's not quite as comprehensive as something like Nextdoor. If I'm going to level any criticism at the tools, it's that it would be good to kind of be able to save a workspace that saves everything for you. It's useful being able to save and load individual pieces, but saving a workspace would really, really help so you can kind of save everything where you are and then load it back up at a later date to work on. I'm pretty sure these tools are still being maintained because every now and then a new feature seems to pop up. So that's Remishop's tools. I think they are well worth checking out if you're doing any kind of Spectrum Next development and you're looking for tile maps or sprites. I'm sure they're good for the audio too. And the generic tools are really useful as well. I'm sure a lot of people will find use for them, which I will in the next section. Until then, happy gaming. This is Aliens, released by Professional Software in 1983. As with all Professional Software titles, this is a basic game, in both senses of the word. Yes, it's a type-in, more or less. You control a laser turret, and you have to defend the city from the invading aliens. The aliens appear at the top of the screen, one at a time, and start dropping bombs. You can shoot the bombs or the aliens, or if you're very good, both. But your first priority is to protect the city. Any bombs that land on that will destroy the buildings beneath it, and once all the buildings have gone, it's game over. It's a simple game, and very reminiscent of early type-ins. The graphics are 8-pixel user-definable graphics, and the sound just consists of beeps. There's nothing special, new or interesting about the game, and it's a typical early 16K release. Or is it? If you recall, I reviewed Rescue by the same company a few years ago, and found on the reverse side of the tape a basic programming lesson, with the author talking you through how the game works. And this game has the same thing. It seems all professional software's games had this, and this one is Lesson 2, with Rescue being Lesson 1. Let's have a little listen then. Welcome to Professional Software's Basic Programming Course, Lesson 2. In this lesson we will look briefly at the program structure, then add attributes and keyboard polling. It doesn't go into as much detail as Lesson 1, but then again it does say that this is the next part, so you'd be expected to have listened to the first one before this. Remember from Lesson 1, 
we said you can test each routine separately. So let us test each of the seven routines in this game. Professional software games came with parts three and four, and probably more. However, they are very expensive, so there isn't much chance of me getting another one in the near future. Each character position on the screen can have four attributes as follows. One, foreground color or ink color. Two, background or paper color. I'll be putting the full audio on my Patreon channel soon. Or normal. This type-in is something different. It didn't appear in a magazine, but it appeared in this book, 15 Graphic Games for the Spectrum. Searching online, some of the games in here are available, but not the last one, Dungeons of Death. The listing is 16 pages long, and it took a while to type out. It has two parts, one that sets up the graphics for the game, and the game itself. However, there is no option to load the second part from the first one, so I had to change this to make it work on a tap file. It does give you the option to send the graphics to a printer for reference, but sadly, not the commands, of which there are plenty. With the game being that long, there were obviously going to be errors, and sure enough, there were. A lot of them. The first issue, though, was the listing itself. It was not printed in order. Here, you'll see the listing jumps from line 2380 to 2890 on page 107, and the missing lines are on page 110, just after line 3472. Once typed in, the errors just kept appearing. Variable not found, this was a typing mistake. Text not aligned. The game auto-completed when you ran it. There was a subscript wrong. The bottom lines were not clearing. At some point you couldn't gaze into the orb, and many, many more. Finally though, I had a fully working version. Now the game, when run, does not look like the screen dump shown in the book, and this was because line 330 did not print the black graphic block, so I've changed this. And here we are. You're given a set of random stats to start with. You can then pick a weapon and some armour. And then it's off into the dungeon. You have to search for the magic orb in the Dungeons of Death and take it back to the entrance on level 1. There are 8 levels with stairs to move up and sinkholes to drop down. There are also monsters to fight, vendors to buy and sell items, warps that send you to a random part of the dungeon, pools to drink from, and treasure to find. The game is quite complex, and there are a lot of random things for practically everything in the game, so I have typed out some instructions that will come in the download. For example, you may come across an orb, not the magic kind, just a normal one, and you have the option to gaze into it. This will use one point of dexterity, or intelligence, depending on whether you look at the listing or the instructions, but it will have a random effect. It may say that it sees you in a bloody mess on the floor, and deduct a dexterity point, or it may give away the location of the magic orb, or it may lie and tell you the wrong location altogether. You can also use flares to light up the areas around you, and these are replenished in chests or just found lying about. That is, if you manage not to get a random bad thing when you open them. When you come across a monster, you are given the option to attack or retreat. Now, retreat does not actually work, and this is in the original listing. Instead, you get a random event, such as the monster tries to attack and misses, or the monster attacks and hits you. But you do not move away from that square. You cannot progress either until you have fought and killed the monster. In fact, there are a few things missing from this game that I think should have been in there. First, the retreat option, as mentioned. This should really throw you to a random point in an adjacent area. Second, the graphics actually include stairs that lead down, but it is never used in the game. Instead, you use sinkholes. Nowhere on screen does the game's title show up or the name of the author. The game doesn't allow you to restart when you finish, it just keeps looping back to the end message. The pauses are very long, so I've shortened them to make it a bit faster to play. There are also some improvements I think would make it better. Things like an easy option that gives you more strength at the start and a better chance of winning. Or maybe changing the colour scheme and adding some colours for the different objects. Or maybe adding the downstairs back in. Or maybe allowing the graphics to be shown at the start as well as being printed out. Or maybe having the monsters have different strengths 
In the game, they've all got the same strength, and the only difference is their names. As it is, though, with a few tweaks that I've added, it's a really nice game to play. I played this a fair few times, obviously using a higher strength value, and found it really relaxing. The initialization does take a long time though, so I usually put the emulator on full speed until it's done. This probably hasn't been seen for over 30 years, and it will be available to download from my website shortly.